Welcome back everyone, day one wrap up, an insightful package here where we break down all the action. I'm John Furrier with Rob Stretchy, my co-host. Rob, you've been analyzing the conversations, we've been digging into all the guests, interrogating them, pun intended, we're just having some fun. Day one in the books of a three-day coverage, but beautiful view here in Vancouver. Um, a lot going on, we started the segment off, the day off saying open source is in trouble, you know, because it's winning and it, AI is coming. Can it handle the, the, the tornado of AI and the momentum that's going to come with that? Pretty much feeling good about that. It's not going to fall over. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I agree. I, I think what's been interesting is everybody's brought that they're considering it, but they consider it just another tool that's going to be in their tool belt. You know, and I think some of them were even talking about how it could augment some of these projects, especially in things like documentation, which I think it absolutely makes a total sense. But it's not going to replace the people coding and participating. Yeah, I think one of the things I observed is people who are data-centric, data thinkers, love the AI story. Everyone else was like, ah, it makes so many mistakes, it's not yet ready for prime time. You know, Ed Warnicke was had a, had a good no. point. Ah, it's just so many mistakes, it hallucinates. You know, nothing to see here, move on. I'm like, I don't know. I think, I mean, I'm bullish on AI. I think, yeah. I think it's going to be a game changer. I think it will shake the industry, but I don't think it's going to have any uh, uh, effect of toppling over the open source um, foundation or anything to do with open right. source. I think it will, might change the nature of projects, but I think the AI is going to be here. Um, and I think your observation is right. I mean, I think, People don't yet know, or they're just getting used to the idea. Yeah, and I, I think again, we're early days with AI contributing to that. People have tried and have AI in their product set, but looking at it, using it more broadly, uh, be it you know going through and looking at op all the open source repositories and making recommendations and things of that nature make a lot of sense. But you know, as Ed put it, it's kind of like a, a junior dev, uh, you know, yeah. an intern or something like that. <laughs> I kind of put it a little bit smarter than that, like you said <laughs> during that, because I look at it and it can code better than I can. It's been a long time, but still. It's like I, a really I, good intern. It's a really good intern. It's more like so. a data, it's more like an entry level, a couple yeah. of years experience person um, who's, who's smart. I think it adds a lot of value. I think the one smart point about that, that, he, that he brought up all day today was, the common theme from the experts was, the human has to know the domain that they're using the, the AI in. Yeah. It can't be a crutch, that's yeah. my word, but that, that's pretty much paraphrasing. Uh, what's your reaction? Yeah, I, I think it was also, uh, in the same vein, was talked about understanding the business problem and understanding the business domain, not just the tech domain, because the tech domain may get better uh, quicker, but still understanding what, who, what is your company's business and how they use that open source or how they use that code still needs to get there. All right, so we checked the box there. Open yeah. source is really going to be impacted by AI. It'll be a positive effect. Second observation, let's dig into platform engineering. Yeah. Again, came up again. We had the CD Foundation with Fidelity Investments. Great segment. I think that brings up, and it was consistent through some other segments. Platform engineering is a, a thing, it has been a thing, we've been talking about it for a long time. Started out the roots of Google's SRE, Site Reliable Engineers, obviously DevOps is infrastructure as code, but what the Fidelity interview brought up, and I want to get your thoughts on this from a deeper perspective is, it brings up the nuance of platform engineering versus platform features in an application. Right. And that this idea that this platform engineering is the new standard is kind of interesting, but I think people might be seeing it. It's highly nuanced. Now, my opinion is, is that it's platform engineering is the new IT, meaning it's the organization that sets the standards at the new group, and then applications have platform features with APIs and dependencies. So it's right. system thinking applications that have developers. So you got platform engineering, platform apps, and then developers that code those apps. And Fidelity said they had 4,000 apps. Yeah. I mean, 4,000. Yeah. It, and all of these large companies have thousands and thousands of apps at this point, and they have developers working on it. I think that when you start to look at, to your point, platform engineering being the new IT, and having setting standards, I think there's going to be that, and he, you know, we even got into it a little bit in that discussion about, well, you're taking some of the creativity 
it, where it's seen by you're taking some of the creativity away from the developers. And I think that's going to be really one of the big pieces of stress in the system is uh, standards and compliance and governance versus I, I give everybody, they can go swipe a card and use a new service or swipe a card or bring, download a new package or a new library. And that, I think that also led into some of the SBOM discussions that we had with the CD Foundation in that same discussion and later on with Ed. So um, to that point, I think there's going to be a lot more stress in the system until this is all figured out, but it is the new IT. Well, I love, I want to just unpack that real quick, double down and come back to you on that because if you double click on what you just said, it's almost as if platform engineering is legit, I agree, and we've been covering it for a while, as you know. Yeah. But I think it's, it's the cloud's problem because the cloud's success breeds the next failure opportunity that needs to be solved, which is cloud was successful, but now they've created another set of problems that need to be solved, which is at scale, the benefits of the cloud creates the ability for anyone to just build an app that has a, that's in, in a platform. Amazon, right. for example, is a platform. Right. So I, if I'm Fidelity, I have to have a cloud team to manage anything that's going to be on Amazon on my company. So you have Amazon's a platform and Fidelity's a platform. So you have a platform and a platform. So I think the cloud guys have to figure this out because this is the next gen cloud. They will solve this problem. Yeah, well this is I think, and, and you, you guys have been discussing this on other uh, CUBE events, is that the repatriation and the movement of apps between clouds and from cloud to colo and regional cloud is real. And I, yeah. I think that this uh, stress that we'll see among these organizations trying to understand, okay, we have, a pla we have multiple yeah. platforms. Well, I just, wanna, I just want to say, and I'll just amplify, I think yeah. repatriation is bullshit. I said that on the <laughs> podcast, I'll say it here. The people who are talking about repatriation don't know what they're talking about yeah. because there's, there's repatriation is taking stuff out of the cloud, bringing yeah. it on premise, let's say Equinox, whatever. But then there's right sizing, yeah. which is not repatriation. If I have cloud success, and I'm going to fine tune it and make some on-prem cloud operations, setting up for say edge or multi-cloud, yeah. that's resizing re and refactoring, not displacing. You're not running away from cloud. Cloud is not failing, cloud is winning. Now there may be some hot spots like NATS, no regards to translation, or right. things in the cloud that causes some platform inconsistencies. That's just the state of the art where we are right now. That's yeah. not a problem. No, it's, it's, I, it's I, not a fatal flaw <laughs> of cloud. Cloud is winning. Yeah. It's not, repatriation is when you want to get out of cloud. I think repatriation isn't happening where I take everything out. I think where it's happening, and to, to your point, it's a, I take a certain aspect of my application, or a set of services out, that need to run either lower latencies or be co-located with some data. I think that's where people are looking. I think also people are getting a little more gun shy and having a little burnout on subscription. Yeah. And I think CapEx you know, in an economy like this looks pretty nice uh, on the books. I want to ask you, on the that before we tie yeah. off the platform engineering, platform discussion, repatriation, you brought this up earlier in some interviews today and, and also at KubeCon. Yeah. The complexity equation shifts. So again, you move the, 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 the complexity problem solving where the next bump is. Right. And that is next gen cloud as you mentioned. This is a huge issue. What's your, explain more about this complexity moving train if you will. Where is it right now? What's the complexity focus that you see with cloud and open source and this next gen yeah. environment. Yeah, I, I think we saw it in spades today. I, I think when you see the overlap between different projects and how you're leaving the consumers to then tie those pieces together, where they all have really great attributes to them, but do you need them all? And in some cases, yes you do, because they're very complementary. In some cases, maybe you don't need them all. Uh, maybe one's, uh, you know, we talked to the folks uh, from Starburst and with Trino, and you, one's using SQL, but then you may be using yeah. Python over somewhere else. And how do you know which projects to go and use and to integrate your data lakes and things of that nature? I think that's where the complexity up the stack really starts to pick yeah. up, and I think that that's even before you're just talking about what's my platform yeah. and, and how and I, I think keep the, it I running. think the use cases and are going to drive that, but also the test yeah. uh, of solving complexity comes down to this. Did it, did it, redu did it reduce the complexity and did it make it simpler right. and easier? 
Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's a question. And I think that's somewhere where the uh, open source foundations that are out there really, really have to uh, key off on, and I, I think really take a, a, a hard look at themselves and yeah. at their projects and understand the architecture and the stack that they're building out. Okay, next item on the summary is ecosystems. The roles of them, their evolution, as they progress to this next generation, open source, a lot more ecosystems. Ecosystems are the mode, are they competing against each other? Is it a feature, is it a bug? And also, how do you monitor? What's the data to monitor them? This came up with Diane Moeller in her new job. Data to monitor the health and also to nurture ecosystems. I believe ecosystems are a good thing, but is it a lock-in? Is it going to yeah. cause people to compete more? Is that just natural? What's your, what's your take? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, again, the great people we've had on today all brought a little bit different from different companies that, you know, they have their split hats that they're wearing, but when you start to look at the ecosystems, it's invaluable because you need that investment in the ecosystems, you, and they're really helping people to continue to contribute to these, and I think where my big question was to Diane, and I still have, is ecosystem health versus contributions and consumption, the contributors that are at the end consumers, and what percentage of the actual contributions are coming from those consumers, to me is, is a big piece of it, because if the consumers are actually contributing back, I think they're not moats. And I think you have a, a, a pretty uh, thriving ecosystem in that, and I think that, that to me is, is pretty key. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll see. Uh, I think, I, you know, like I said when Diane was on, I saw the Global Grid Forum, then the Open Grid Forum basically dissolve because they didn't have that. And yeah. it was more of a moat and competing moats that were trying yeah. to be brought forward. And I think that's definitely, uh, you know, some of the things that could, drive people away from open source or not contributing. Yeah, and I think open source is a series of ecosystems that need to thread together, yeah. and it's okay to be decoupled and cohesive within them, in and of themselves, so um, thumbs up on yeah. ecosystems. Agreed. But transitioning that to the real quick question, you mentioned chips and up and down the stack. Open source is moving up and down the stack, so yes, you can see ecosystems emerging. The ecosystem for hardware IoT with RISC-V right. is a lot different than the DevOps CD Foundation. Right. But they still develop, they're still developers, they're still building, and so, you know, you have this new phenomenon of open source up and down, from silicon to the app. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's where we're seeing a lot of interesting uh, things with the different foundations, and I think that some foundations do a, a better job than other foundations at understanding their stack or their portion of the stack but when you start to look at things like Apache, where they have such a broad yeah. approach to what's in their foundation, uh, and you, know, you start to look at the contributions where 95% of the contributions of a particular project are all from a supporting company, yeah. is that truly open source or not? And what happens if that company you know, goes away because yeah. they don't have product market fit. Yeah, certainly ARM and Intel, the two dominant players. RISC-V was a great interview that highlighted yes. that piece. Of course, we've been talking about silicon on chip, Broadcom, and our I, pod to super apps, super compute, super cloud, super apps, yeah. super I thought, open source. And I think what was interesting in the RISC-V discussion was the concept that embracing of openness is really actually helping those companies that have proprietary to actually sell the proprietary in a better way and in a better light. We've got a great community angle. We had a great interview here I was supposed to do, but I got bounced out because Lisa Marie took over for me. She did a great job with Liz Rice, Aisha, and Josh. They did a preview of their panel. It was the first new format on theCUBE. I thought that went great. So shout out to Lisa, Liz, and Aisha, and Josh. Thank you very much for um, hijacking theCUBE. I mean, taking over theCUBE. I mean, being a CUBE host, appreciate it, great stuff. Rob, final point to wrap up day one is that it was kind of a subtext to our conversation around AI and you know, the stability of open source and all that action, is the undertone of wealth creation, new venture creation, entrepreneurship, product development, because at the end of the day, software is free and it's all great, it's winning, it's won. People are going to build. They're going to build stuff for public service, public support, for, for their own hobbies, they're going to build for their ventures or their companies. 
it's software. They're going to build something. So what's your take on the entrepreneurship, startup angle, what products, opportunities do you see? What's your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I, I think that some of the discussions we had and some of the questions I still have sitting through some of these projects and understanding what they do, uh, that I've sat out on the floor in other rooms and sat there and asked myself, is this a, a product, a project, or just a feature? And I think it's the product market fit aspect of it and understanding why am I doing this? And mm -hmm. is it because I brought it here, I'm really smart and I want to contribute, and I, going to build a company around this longer term, but I want other people to help me build the company and take some of that legal away, or take some of that marketing away. And that's yeah. going to be my, you know, I'm I going to have a product-led growth, yeah. and the PLG movement, and I'm, I, I think that people get, I think, mistake product market fit with PLG <laughs> far too often. I call often. it the immaculate conception. <laughs> it, it, it never happens, right? The, right. The, the idea that you come in and create a product, except for one time, that was called Twitter. Yeah. And they could never change the product back. And even Elon Musk can't even get it right. So Twitter was the, the only company that I know of in the history of my life that got it right out of the gate by accident on purpose. Yeah. And then they could never get it right fix it or change it, but Manfred Moser from um, Starburst brought this up. Yeah. He says he loves to come to open source because the collaboration, he ran the Java user group in early days, he's an OG like us. If, you, if you're a product person, you bring something to open source, you're going to get collaboration. That's, I think the key is, it's so hard, as you know, entrepreneur, you know how hard it is to get product market fit. It's extremely yes. difficult. Yeah. Um, product market fit can be accelerated, only if you have better data and better collaboration. So I think, so I think this market is still robust for product opportunities, given the shift to AI and given the shift to cloud native, given the shift to the security and AI. Um, I think it's just great. Now the question yeah. is, where do you land? Right. Yeah, and I, I think that to me has always been one of those things that uh, it's not just about the contributors that are actually contributing code to these projects. I think it's about the ecosystem around them from the foundations, if they have people who understand products and are product people. And some of the foundations do a better job with this and basically helping people understand, is this a, a smaller you know, sub-project of something else, let's package you up into that and get that product market fit, but understand yeah. that you're not, you can't be alone, you, yeah. you, you, ha you can't, do this all yourself. And I think that that's the interesting thing is going to be, do they take a more product management approach to these projects going yeah. forward? You know, and I think this is a classic uh, you know, transition from old school R&D yeah. to tinkering in the garage. Entrepreneurship form is pretty much the same. It's either by accident or you're tinkering and you discovery, but you're building, you're trying things, you're working with friends or colleagues, you're riffing and you're just rubbing things that sticks together and spark comes. I think that's the magic of this open source. And I said it earlier in the open was, open source is very entrepreneurial, but not in the classic MBA sense. It's not like, oh, I, you know, I, you know, start a business plan. They're, very, they're builders and yes. they're smart, right? So you got builders, they're smart, and they, they can see opportunity from a nerd's perspective. Right. Now, now you add people to the equation. You got mentoring, you got access to potentially insights, hopefully like the cube, some of the things you're saying are, is really insightful, like product market fit. Like they don't sit around here talking about product market fit. They just talk about, does it work? <laughs> does it right. solve a problem? And they go, whoa, that's right. interesting. I think it's very entrepreneurial. I think you're going to see a lot of product opportunities. The question is, how will the business models progress? That's the question for tomorrow. Yep. How does the business models change? We saw dual license work earlier on open source. Now you got, okay, I'm going to put a project in there, freemium, premium. It's obviously booming. It's going to be a huge opportunity. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think some of the side conversations that are going on about do you give away the software for free but own the control planes? Do you do it as a SaaS? I think there's all different ways to go about it, but I think that to me, you know, I think we started and had this discussion earlier was around, you know, is there going to be another Red Hat? Well, the final point we'll pick up tomorrow is companies funding the efforts. Yeah. We heard uh, Istio from Google, they dragged their feet a little bit too long, people were kind of, you know, miffed about that. So, who's the heavy dropping the dollars in here? Yeah. This monetization needed, there is funding required you got the big dogs like Google and Red Hats of the world right. out there and Amazon's here. 
where's the funding? What's the responsibility of that contribution? So this is all evolving. Yeah, yeah, I think that was interesting. I mean, even with Meta uh, joining OpenJS and be, that being announced uh, during the keynote this morning, I think it has to be more of those types of people getting involved, a broader segment of companies. Well, I'll sure. just leave a day one wrap up and you can comment on it if you want, yeah. but I think the big takeaway for me personally is the AI waves coming. I don't think there's going to be a much uh, of, a, of, a, of a toppling of open source at all, so I think we're in good shape there. Um, they could be in trouble if they don't keep their eye on it, but the bigger issue is the power dynamic of the old model of open source, which is very foundation, open source communities, to now that open source is now the software industry collectively because proprietary software doesn't really exist as, as a dominant force. Open source is the software industry. So the industry dynamics includes entrepreneurs and, their, and, the, and the funding behind it, which is capital markets, the companies like Meta, Google, and others, and the, the, the developers. So the role of the big companies like Meta who leaked their AI. <laughs> I mean, Rob, they leaked <laughs> their AI? Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. I doubt that no. will happen. The Google memo that was leaked. You're starting to see there could be a competitive strategy from yeah. the big companies to inject Kool-Aid into open source I think to so. To revitalize as a steroid, as a growth hack. Yeah. What do you think about that? That's a very provocative conversation. Uh, I agree. I, I think it's going to be an excellent day two tomorrow when we get to talk to people and further go down this, this, this uh, thread and understand how do we be successful and keep this going now that, like you said, open source is yeah. one, proprietary is dead how do you get to that next level, and who's going to be those contributors yeah. to that. And shout out to AWS for announcing and open sourcing Cedar and, and some of their internal projects contributing back, and also they have the, the Open Software Secure Foundation, Open SSF, and a lot more. Again, day one, Rob, great, great commentary, yeah, great you. to have you on theCUBE, great views here, sitting here in Vancouver in beautiful weather, great location, Open Source Summit, 2023, wrapping up day one. I'm John Furrier, Rob Stretchy. Thanks for watching.